so you don't have to be a Victorian to have uh, architecture that is worthy of conservation. It can be listed and designated under the Ontario Heritage Act. There is no time limit on a property that may be uh, designated or listed. So you could actually include something that's uh, less than uh, a year old in, in the register uh, if your council was so, uh, so inclined. Uh, and it's, uh, the designation can be by individual property or by district. And the criteria for evaluation continue to apply, even though you're, uh, you're, you're looking at 1940 architecture. And this can be uh, design value, historical value, and contextual value. So these are the, the broad criteria that they wor we work with in heritage conservation. And uh, you should keep those criteria in mind when you're considering 1940 architecture. And, and 1940 architecture, 1940 plus architecture can easily meet those criteria. Okay, these are some of the sources that I've used. Uh, and the first one that appears here, uh, Ontario Architecture on the left-hand side by uh, John Blumenson is, is perhaps uh, the best uh, and in terms of having a source that uh, can apply directly to your work. Uh, now it says 1874 to the present. Uh, John issued this in 2000. So uh, keep in mind, it's really just up to, to the year 2000. Uh, although some of his comments continue to apply. And then there have been a number of other publications on, on uh, architecture and modern architecture. There's one specifically devoted to Canadian modern architecture, 1967 to the present. Uh, you see it there. It's, it's all across Canada. It's uh, not just Ontario. And then you've also got Harold Commons, uh, A History of Canadian Architecture in two volumes. And that starts from the beginning up until uh, when he published this around 2005, 2006. On the top right hand side, you'll see Concrete Toronto. And that is uh, a fascinating book on uh, concrete buildings in the Toronto area uh, in the 1960s and 70s. And working across the bottom, there's uh, an architectural style spotter's guide uh, that gives you an international perspective and provides uh, some more recent information than John Blumenson's book. And then the last one that I found uh, of interest, even though it's Victoria and British Columbia, it's conservation guidelines for modernist architecture. So people are looking at modern architecture and how you can serve it. And uh, I, it, I think it is an important component of our cultural heritage. And in fact, we're seeing it uh, appear in, in our, our story. Um, so uh, post-1940 architecture has appeared in costume dramas. Now, normally we think of costume dramas as being Edwardian or Victorian, but uh, there's a recent uh, TV series out, if you get a chance to look at it, it's The Queen's Gambit, and it's uh, about uh, chess and a woman's rise in, in a field dominated by men in the 50s, 60s, and 70s. And Although there are many themes in this program, in the background is the architecture of the period. And here you see her about to ascend a staircase in a hotel in Las Vegas that was built in the 70s. And yes, it's a staircase, but look at the design of that staircase. Uh, so it, it, the, this period can say something and does say something uh, that, that is important in, in our lives and uh, uh, is being uh, demonstrated in TV programs that are coming out now. So a fascinating program, I believe it's on Netflix. 
So architecture is an evolving continuum. Uh, an architect or designer's work can evolve over a lifetime. So this is just Frank Lloyd Wright, a uh, famous American architect. And you see uh, from the 1890s what he was doing uh, just outside of Chicago. So somewhat traditional architecture, he's developing a few flares there. But you can see the progress that he made over his long career into the 1950s on the right-hand side, you have the Guggenheim Museum in 1959. Uh, in the middle, you have Falling Water, which was the mid 1930s. It's now a public museum that, uh, that you can visit. So it's important to understand that even architects are, are evolving in how they deal with architecture. Uh, so, um, Modern architecture, we can often identify the architect for the building. So it's important to place that building in the context of the architect's work. Uh, keeping in mind that uh, the, his, his or her work can change substantially over time as Frank Lloyd Wright has clearly demonstrated when you move from left to right. So again, the theme architecture is an evolving continuum. The styles that you're looking at from 1940 and beyond actually had their ancestry much earlier. Uh, and the modern, what we call the modernist movement in the art started in the late 1890s. Uh, so you see uh, this particular uh, piece of artwork uh, done in, in uh, the late 1890s. It was part of the, the Bauhaus School. Uh, and the Bauhaus School looked at art, architecture, and other aspects of culture and attempted to adapt it, even to the extent of lettering. So the lettering on the, uh, on the building that you see on the right, which is the Bauhaus School in Germany, uh, the lettering was specifically set up uh, for by those that that art group, and it's interesting that this building that you're looking at on the right hand side was built between 1904 and 1911. So this is in contrast to what you often think of in this Edwardian period, but they were looking at modern ideas at that point in time. And those modern ideas have progressed down to what we're doing with now. So the Bauhaus had a strong influence that continued into the 1970s. Um, the other thing you should keep in mind is the, the architectural styles uh, from 19, prior to 1940, often continued beyond. So for example, the art modern style, which you see on the left-hand side, this house uh, in Tweed, Ontario, uh, uh, that was built uh, in, in the 1940s. And then on the right-hand side, you see the international uh, design of the Toronto Dominion Center. And this was designed by uh, Ludwig Mies van der Rohe. And uh, van der Rohe was a disciple of the Bauhaus school. And in fact, he was uh, uh, the, the lead, the head of the, the design school uh, when the Nazis came in and he left in 1933 uh, to come to America uh, because of the problems he encountered. But here he is producing this building in the 1960s in Toronto, influenced very much by uh, the Bauhaus School. So, you know, architectural styles can change in response to changes in taste and changes uh, as a result of opinions. So on the left, you've got Philip Johnson's glass house uh, from the early 1950s. Uh, this is in Connecticut. And he was very much a modernist architecture in the inter international school. So coming from the Bauhaus and their 
their theme uh, that Ludwig uh, van der Rohe, uh, Mies van der Rohe uh, said, less is more. So there's no ornamentation on this building. Uh, in fact, I don't know if I'd want to live in this house uh, because you can look right through it. So you need lots of curtains, but nevertheless, that was what they were designing and that is now a heritage site. On the right hand side, you've got postmodernists and the postmodernists look back on the modernists and said, your theme is less is more. Well, we think it's less is a bore and we want to see uh, more flamboyant architecture. So this is the Royal Ontario Museum here. And this is the addition that was made to the museum and it's postmodern structural expressionism. So in contrast to the very clean lines that you see on the left-hand side, you've got all these angles, different angles, different materials. Uh, so it, in part, it was a reaction to what the modernists had to say. So just keep this in mind, architecture is always evolving and, and yet there, there is a continuum here. So let's take a look at some of the, the styles uh, in modern architecture. So you wanna look at from 1940 and on. Okay, so this is the art, art modern style. So remember that house in Tweed? That was an example of that style. It was streamlined and the high point of this uh, type of architecture was the 1939 World, New York World's Fair. And here you see a building on the left-hand side. This is the CBC transmitter building in Milton. And it was built in 1938, about 1938. Uh, that's when they purchased the property. And it's, it's now listed by the municipality. It can't be designated because it's federally owned, but they can list it and say it's, uh, it's an important building. It's still uh, a transmitter building for the CBC. And some of the attributes of streamline of the, the art murder and style uh, are you see on the right hand side, the horizontal effect, the rounded corners. So you see up in the top here, there are rounded corners on the building. Uh, there's very smooth wall surfaces the flat roofs, uh, the continuous string courses. So you've got a string course here, you've got another string course here, and one at the very edge of the eave here, uh, all painted in blue. Uh, you've got window bands. So this is a band of window here, and you've got use of glass block. Uh, so uh, here you see the glass block in this window band. Uh, the house in Tweed had wraparound corners and many of these types of build, buildings had polished metal surfaces. So that's the art modern style. The international style. So this is what was coming out of the, the, the Baja in, in Germany. Um, so it's a complete rejection of historical styles. And, and uh, in addition to saying less is more, they said, let the materials speak. So in this case, you see the structural materials of this house. This is the Hart Massey House in Ottawa, uh, built in 1959. You see the materials in this house uh, speaking to you directly, the, the glass curtain walls. Uh, these pilates, the piers that the house is built on. Um, and uh, it's, it's a, a constructive or an industrial image, uh, but it has been used in, for residential purposes. As I mentioned, it's a lack of ornamentation. It was in, influenced by the Baja and it's a cubist composition. So you've got these cubes. Here you see a, a cube, another cube. So it's very much building on these cubes. Uh, you've got flat roofs, clean lines, straight edges, smooth exter exterior finishes, 
And, and uh, although it started in the 1930s when they were using uh, frequently brick or concrete, uh, after the 1950s, it, 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 they used uh, glass forming curtain walls. So this, this building is designated. It's part of the Rockcliffe Park Heritage Conservation District. And if you go on to Parks Canada's site, they actually have a long exposition on this house. Hart Massey, a member of the Massey family, was an architect himself. So he designed this house and he lived in the house. And in fact, there was an addition put on the house, but the new owners respected the design and the addition was put, I believe it was on this side. So that's an addition, although you wouldn't know it. They, they wanted to replicate uh, the architectural theme of that building. Okay, a completely different approach. Victory Housing, 1940 to 1950. And it, it, the highlight is it's affordable housing for war employees, veterans, and, and uh, what did I have? And the military. So these were often associated with military bases or, or industrial operations, uh, but they are across Canada. Um, and here you see one in, in uh, Kitchener. Uh, this is also, uh, these buildings are all designated. This is the St. Mary's Heritage Conservation District in Kitchener. Uh, and they were built in 19, 1945 to 1948. So immediate post-war period. And the houses were an attempt to build affordable housing with a lack of materials. So this started out in the wartime when there were very limited materials available to, to build housing. So they, they were relatively small buildings, mostly wood frame structures with uh, clapboard siding. And they came in several different uh, variations. Uh, and here you see two of them, the story and the half and the one story house with a, a gable roof and a hip roof. And they were so concerned about being economical that in the, this gable roof, they didn't build any dormer windows. Uh, so that, that is an important attribute of, of these buildings. These people were amazed when the uh, planners came in to this area and said, we think this is a heritage area. And, and actually the people embraced it because they said no one has paid us any respect for our area in the past. But you do have these uh, uh, victory housing developments uh, throughout Canada. And there are, there are a number of them in, in uh, in Ontario, I don't know if there are any in, in Richmond Hill, uh, but certainly it was such an affordable housing style that it was replicated, this style of house, even this bungalow style over here, uh, were replicated long into the, uh, afterwards into the 1950s. They weren't part of a, a, a victory <clears throat> war effort, but they were just uh, affordable housing. I, I tend to focus on the ones that are part of a grouping rather than uh, uh, as individual ones. But here you see some of the attributes. This, this is all dealing with housing. It's residential, one to one and a half story, gable or hip roofs, shallow eaves, small sash windows, uh, clapboard exterior finish. Also, they, they did use some composite materials including shingle siding, stucco, and brick veneer. And as I mentioned, no dormer windows, small entrance opening with a, often with a small little veranda here. Uh, this one has the three part picture window in the front. Um, and there were several different plans. This is a side hall one. This one over here is a center hall. So, uh, very modest 
housing, but nevertheless, uh, it has been considered to be of heritage value. Okay, this is what John Blumenson calls 1950s contempo. And it was uh, common during 1945 to 1965. And it was part of the post-war optim optimism. There was ex experimentation in, in the design of housing and other buildings. And the high point for this was something called the Festival of Britain. And uh, this was where in Great Britain, they were attempting to, to show the best new housing that they could build in their bombed out areas. So they, were, they set up a number of designs, uh, not just housing, but other types of buildings. And uh, I guess the best example of this uh, is in Stratford, where you have the, uh, uh, the Shakespearean auditorium that was built in the 1950s. And on the left-hand side, you see someone that has embraced, embraced this 1950s contempo style. This is uh, a regional architect, uh, Joe W. Story. And these are two buildings in, in Chatham that he designed. So you have this house with a carport on the side, uh, a very shallow gable roof, uh, large uh, brick veneer wall with a large, almost floor to ceiling window in it. The door, it's hard to see, but in this case, the door has, uh, an, instead of rectangular glass windows in it, it has round glass windows. So he's clearly experimenting. This was his own house. So this was the architect's house he lived in. And he also designed this, this convent on the right-hand side. So you see the attributes for this type of architecture, uh, varied materials, bright colors. No longer, you're no longer building in cubes like you were with the, the uh, modernists. Um, there's no historical ornamentation on these houses. And there's a contrast between solid wall surfaces that you see here and the glass surfaces. So there are strong horizontal lines in the buildings and the residential buildings and it's emphasized often by a side court carport. Sometimes they were built asymmetrically so there'd be sort of a one story part and then there'd be a two story part over here or in behind. So you've had the start of a split level housing. Uh, as I mentioned, floor to ceiling plate glass windows. And the Don Mills area in Toronto uh, was originally designed using these, this type of architectural style. So you would have seen that type of housing throughout Don Mills. Um, unfortunately, uh, housing has become so overpriced and these were such mos modest houses that many are being demolished to build uh, much larger residential structures, humongous structures. So, you know, you have to ask yourself in Richmond Hill, if you have something like this, is, is it worth saving? And in this case, uh, the city of Chatham or, or city municipality of Chatham, Kent has said, yes, both of these are listed structures, the house and the convent. So the next architectural style is brutalism, uh, 1960 to 75. Uh, I've subtitled this, The Joy of Concrete. And you either hate it or you like it. And sometimes you can hate it and they do grow on you. Uh, and th this is part of the problem I have with modernist architecture is that I grew up with this. I'm familiar with this. This, in fact, this was a building site when I was going to university. 
So I saw the start of the construction of this when I was at university. And you think, is this heritage? Uh, because I experienced it during my lifetime. But yes, I think this is. This certainly is part of our, our, our culture. Uh, and when this went up, we referred to this as Fort Book because it does look like a fort. And in fact, this section of it resembles something that the Nazis built in, in several of their cities to defend the cities. And they put uh, their air defense uh, guns up here, their flat guns on top. And so they had these concrete impregnable towers uh, and most of them survived the war un unaffected by all the devastation that went on around them. So here you have this very imposing structure. Um, so this is the Robarts uh, Library at U of T. It was completed in 1973. Uh, the architects Mathers and Haldenby and Toronto has listed this. And this appears very prominently in, in Michael McClellan's Concrete Toronto. Obviously, it's, it's, it's a big structure. Um, so the brutalists believed in using concrete in its natural state. So they don't try and dress it up anyway. Uh, in this case, you've got a very smooth pattern here. And then on the tower, this tower element, you've got a ridged element. So that would have been in the forms that formed the concrete. And sometimes you can have vertical lines where, where the forms uh, are pulled away and you have these vertical lines of concrete. So very strong element. In fact, this, I believe this is partly the elevator shaft for the Fisher Rare Book Library. Fascinating library if you ever get a chance to get in there. Um, uh, the U of T archives are in this, in this structure. Uh, but it's also a vent. Uh, so it's got block-like figures predominant, although you do have some brick and glass maybe used, but they're very narrow windows here very narrow window bands throughout, small ones on the lower levels. Uh, simple lines, large scale, uh, exposure of man, uh, mechanical systems to public view. So this, this mechanical system, although it's clothed, clothed in concrete, it's, ex, uh, it's open to public view and they can result in complex uh, plans. So the plan for the Robarts Library, the floor plan, is, is really quite complex. This type of architecture was often used in, in uh, uh, government buildings. Uh, a number of city halls in Ontario are built from this brutalist style. Um, in government offices, uh, institutional buildings, and some educational facilities. Uh, Ron Tom, who was an architect who designed uh, Trent University, which used a lot of concrete, uh, wrote a, a scathing review of a fort book when it was first constructed of saying how much he hates the building. So uh, you can hate them, you love them, uh, but they are there and they are in your face. And I think this is part of our heritage. Okay, another style is structural expressionism. And this is from the 1960s on. And you've got uh, angular, angular sculptural forms. Uh, and here you have another view of the addition to the Royal Ontario Museum, completed in 2007. Daniel Liebskin, an internationally renowned architect, often such architects are referred to as starchitects, uh, and it is part of uh, uh, a heritage easement agreement protected property. 
So uh, the older museum, you can just see the corner of it in the background uh, uh, is still there, very much so. Um, I was involved, I was working in Heritage Preservation Services in the city of Toronto at the time. And we were brought out to the, uh, to the museum to talk about this and to look at uh, the various uh, architects that had submitted for a competition. And some of them had developed intricate models. Uh, Raymond Moriyama had uh, done, done uh, a beautiful model of what he wanted to build. And Daniel Liebskin did his on the back of a napkin, literally a napkin. And that was his submission. And we sort of stood back and we said, ah, there is no way that one is going to win. Well, that's what was constructed. Uh, so you can see uh, buildings that were designed on a napkin. There can be a final product there. So it uses angular forms and imaginative internal spaces and it's complex engineering. And when we were viewing the plans, this indeed was complex because how it interfaced with the, the uh, older museum building in the background was a real challenge because it's coming, it's meeting the older building at really odd angles. So uh, it was a challenge for the engineer to come up with the design that could provide a waterproof connection and not damage the older building in behind. Another form of expressionism I call organic expressionism and it's from the 1970s on and this is flowing sculptured form buildings. So here on the left you have uh, a nearby example to you uh, this is the York Region Administration Building. It was completed in 1992. Uh, Douglas Cardinal is an architect, a uh, very interesting man. He's uh, Métis, grew up in the prairies uh, and uh, designed uh, the Museum of Civilization in Ottawa, which you will see also has flowing uh, lines very much like the York Region building. Uh, Newmarket has not listed or designated the building, although in my opinion it clearly should be um, for a number of reasons, not only because uh, Douglas Art Cardinal is a nationally renowned Canadian architect, but it is a, uh, a landmark on Young Street. You can't help but see it when you drive up Young Street. Uh, so it meets uh, several criteria. And in fact, uh, in 2015, it won an award from, um, I think it was the Concrete Manufacturers of Canada uh, this was the award winning building for that year, even though it was 15 years after the building had been built. And I also have uh, a relationship with this building. I was working in the York Region Planning Department at the time, and my boss was an architect. And he got called in and said, we're thinking about hiring Douglas Cardinal to design this building. And this is roughly what it might look like. He, ne he nearly fell off his seat because this was a progressive move for York Region to design something that wasn't just a traditional office building. Uh, so this would, be, would have been the late 1980s when, when the design was being considered. Um, so it was a very progressive move. Uh, my boss complained on the interior. He said, it's got these sausage corridors because it is a, a long, long building here with offices on either side. Uh, so you do have a very long uh, corridor that, yes, it eats up a lot of space, but nevertheless, you do have 
uh, quite an impressive building uh, as a result. So on, on the right, you see attributes of this organic expressionism. Uh, flowing sculptural form, it can include angular elements. Uh, so this is sort of an angular element, these two tower pieces. The shapes may mirror the site. So in this case, the landscape has been adjusted to, to, uh, uh, to meet uh, the requirements of the building. And in fact, Cardinal did a fair bit of research on, on the development of the area. This was a rural area when uh, on the west side of Young Street in Newmarket when this was built. So he was looking at uh, the architecture uh, and the landscape, landscapes of the area when he was designing this. Uh, shapes may mirror the site. Uh, it can use concrete, limestone, or other materials. Uh, Cardinal's favorite material was Manitoba Tyndall limestone. Uh, and uh, you can see fossils in that limestone in any of the buildings that he used it in. Uh, York Region rebelled at the cost of it and instead used concrete. Uh, but it still, I think, is an effective building, so they used concrete. It's got elongated window bands, so you can see just a continuous window band, concrete window, concrete window, just in, in bands around the building. It has a prominent tower, uh, tower element, flat roof, and as I mentioned, long interior corridors. So you've got this organic expressionism style. Postmodernism, uh, 1965, and I've simply titled this More Please. And it's a case where we want more than just the minimalist approach that uh, Mies van der Rohe and the, and the modernist internationalists came up with. So you have a very early example of this in, in uh, the new city hall in Toronto. Uh, completed in 1965. The Finnish archi architect Vilio Revel, in association with the Canadian architectural firm J.B. Parkin and Associates were the architects for this. There was a design competition. So again, uh, City Council in Toronto really stuck its neck out um, in, in uh, coming up with this very uniquely designed building. So it, it has many shapes. This is the council chamber here. Uh, and these arms were uh, of the building were originally intended to house uh, on one side city staff, on the other side, metro staff. So it was to be the headquarters for both city and metropolitan Toronto. Um, so it's got various textures. Again, this appears in, in Michael McClellan's Concrete Toronto Building uh, a book because it makes use of concrete, but it makes use of concrete uh, in a way which sometimes disguises it. So you've, you've, you've got, this is all concrete on this side, on the, out, on the outside, so it's solid concrete wall yet it's been broken up uh, with the forms uh, and the concrete and also the finish of the concrete. So it isn't just a natural finish, it's actually been textured except for these bands which break up the height. And it can incorporate many styles. So you do have a bit of brutalist uh, uh, feature to it. So you've got this podium base here. Um, and then you have the big concrete plaza in front of it. So again, I have to look at this building and say, I was there when it opened. Is this the heritage building? And uh, yes, it is. Uh, I was there at the opening. I was in high school at the time when it opened. Uh, but yeah, we came down because Toronto was the center. Uh, and so there was a big celebration in, uh, with the opening 
And then I ended up working in the building uh, for the city of Toronto many years later. A uh, very interesting building to work in. It's very much focused on the, the visual expression on the exterior. On the interior, it's uh, not the greatest building to work in. Uh, when I was a plebeian there, I had a glass office here. So all the plebs had uh, sat out on the, uh, the glass side of the building. And again, there was a corridor going around the center. And then on the inside were the senior um, officers of the corporation. And they didn't have any windows. So you can imagine you go into your cave. And, and Ravel also designed the furniture for the building. So you actually had concrete desks in your in the interior offices. Uh, there's still some of that furniture left. They've kept it uh, in, in a few places, uh, but a lot of it has been replaced. So I got promoted and ended, ended up in an interior office and it was just not the most pleasant experience to be in. And you kind of kept your door open all the time because it was uh, uh, just just not the greatest for those working inside. And in fact, we were there, I was in it uh, when there was an earthquake. Uh, yeah, we do get uh, tremors here in Toronto in the Toronto region occasionally. And I was in the tall tower. I think I was on the 11th floor somewhere around here. And yes, the building did shake and we wondered a bit about it, but now it held strongly. Uh, very interesting building, uh, designated by the city of Toronto. Um, on the right-hand side, you've got another example of postmodernism. You've got uh, Roy Thompson Hall, uh, built in 1982. Arthur Erickson was the architect, and it's obviously in Toronto, and it is also designated. And again, that these are rejecting the angular modern elements that appeared in, in that modern and in internationalist style. They use various materials and textures and colors on the exterior, and it may incorporate a number of different styles. So in this one, uh, the dome is an interesting uh, style and, and uh, Roy Thompson Hall, it's, uh, I call it the inverted cupcake. So it's got a flat roof on top, sloping sides. And this was one of the few buildings that I was involved in at the city when they were proposing to alter the interior. And I got a phone call from Arthur Erickson saying, no, you can't change the seating on the inside of the building. Uh, because that's what they wanted to do. Not the exterior, the interior seating. First time the architect who designed the building was still alive and, and talked to me. And I'm afraid I put him off by saying, look, you got to talk to the managers of the theater. They're having problems with the seating that you designed. Anybody in the center that wants to get out of there uh, has to go to the washroom in the middle of a performance, has to move dozens and dozens of people by row to get out of their seat. So anyhow, an interesting building, uh, but one, one that, you know, you can designate. Okay, so I've gone through the various styles that takes us sort of up to the, 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 the present. But another thing I'd like to talk about is adaptive reuse of, of buildings. And this is coming out of architecture uh, and from the 1940s to about 1975. This was relatively radical uh, in terms of the reuse of older structures. And this is this case of two properties that I've worked with. Uh, one I'm currently working with on the left-hand side uh, is a house in East Gwillimbury, uh, the John S. Millard House. It's on Young Street in East Gwillimbury. 
uh, built in 1868 and it was readapted in 1966. And I, I suspect I know who the original architect was. He was also an architect from, from Sharon, but there's no documentation to confirm it. So I can only attribute the original architect, but I know for sure that it was B. Napier Simpson that readapted this building uh, in 1966 because his plans are in the Ontario archives. And there you see uh, one of his plans uh, right here for the, uh, the east elevation of, of the building. So this is uh, repurposing of heritage buildings and attempting to readapt them to, to modern lifestyles. Napier Simpson was one of the earliest architects here. And if uh, you've got any buildings that uh, uh, he has dealt with uh, in your municipality, I think you should seriously consider listing them or designating them. Uh, because this is a very early step in, in heritage building conservation. Um, Napier Simpson had his offices or his house in Thornhill. So he uh, did a lot of work in, in the uh, greater Toronto area and in York region in particular. Uh, his house is in old Thornhill in Markham. Um, so that's that's one he did. I know of a number of others he did in, in York region. Uh, Napier liked to design his own verandas. So verandas were often uh, parts of the house that vanished. Uh, they were subject to severe weathering. They may not be there uh, when, when we come along, or in this case, when Nap Napier Simpson came along. And so he designed a veranda, but there must have been some discussion between the owner and the architect because the plans don't show the veranda that was built. It's similar, but not the same. The post, this is a trellis veranda, whereas he was working with uh, single posts in his drawing. So, so it's interesting drawings, whoops, uh, uh, architectural drawings that you've come across may not reflect entirely the as-built situation. So I have also have a house in your municipality on Leslie Street. I think this is 11121 Leslie Street, if I remember that correctly, 11,000 Leslie Street. Uh, and this is the Hilts House. And I was uh, hired to do a heritage impact assessment and ended up in the basement of the house where there were filing cabinets that had been left behind of photographs and well, tax returns too. I wasn't interested in those, but I was really interested in the photographs and many of them were dated. So this particular photograph I found uh, was dated 1940. And this was the property that the uh, Bodens were going to buy. Uh, so this is how the house appeared in 1940. Uh, it was built uh, by Godf Godfrey Hiltz uh, around 1850. It may actually have been built in the 1840s. It's a stone farmhouse. And then it was readapted in 1942. I don't know who the architect is or was, uh, and I, I did search, uh, but couldn't find it, but I came across a photograph in 1943 of the same house. So this is the south elevation here, and you see there's been an exterior chimney built in a fireplace, whereas there's only a very narrow chimney uh, on the 1940 house, and the veranda is gone from the 1940 photographs. So this is the type of veranda that they put on. And then these dormer windows were added. So, <clears throat> excuse me, the house was readapted, uh, but I think it is a very early example of uh, attempts to readapt buildings, uh, particularly houses, to modern use. 
uh, and and this is an early effort at it. It's not entirely what we would do today, but it is an attempt at that time to uh, to retain such buildings and readapt them to to uh, current use. Uh, so I believe you have designated that. If you haven't, uh, you should have. It's part of a, a, a large uh, development now. It still sits on its original site. Uh, so the development has gone on all around it. And, and uh, I believe one of the Baden uh, descendants were talking about moving in. Now this, I did this study about four or five years ago. I don't know whether they, they did move in. So you've got styles and then you've got adaptive reuse. And I think if you can find a, a good examples of adaptive reuse, particularly from this early period, I think it is additional justification for uh, uh, designating, uh, listing and designating uh, uh, property. Finally, yes, I am coming to the end if uh, I still have people with me here. It looks like I do. Uh, some closing comments. Developments may be an amalgam of various styles. So this was my opening photograph. And if you don't know where this is, you should know where. You should find it soon. This is the uh, Ontario College of Art and Design in Toronto on, on McCall Street in behind the Art Gallery of Ontario. Uh, it was built in 2008. Uh, Will Alsop, who recently died, uh, designed it. He was a British architect. So this is another star architect that has been brought in and it's part of a designated property. And again, I was involved with this when OCAD came in to the planning department at the city of Toronto and heritage was brought in and they said, this is what we want to build. And I looked at it and well, we all looked at it and said, you know, it's a table. And there were sort of little worms hanging down from it, uh, which uh, it, it was not a very good model. Uh, uh, but I, we said, ah, oh, that's never going to get built. And Heritage was involved because these are two listed uh, properties. And the Pilates, these elements that you see here, holding the flying table up in the air, uh, their original intent was to demolish these buildings, that these listed buildings, and put the Pilates down and the site of those buildings. And we said, if you can avoid doing that, please avoid doing that, which uh, interestingly enough, they did. And I believe OCAD owns these two buildings now too. So they kept them, uh, but this is a landmark structure. You can't help but notice this whenever you're walking around the area. And you're gonna say, is this heritage? Well, you got to keep in mind that maybe 30 or 40 years from now, somebody is going to say, wow, look at what they built back then. So, yes, I think this is very much heritage. It's part of our cultural heritage. And this encompasses a number of style elements. It's got the modern internationalist architectural style. So it's a big cube. Uh, yes, yeah, some people have called it the flying table or the flying wedge. It has structural expressionism. So you've got these pilates, these huge pilates coming down and supporting this structure up above. And then this red thing that you see coming down is the escalator that takes you up from the ground floor into the upper floors. So you've got these structural elements very much present, very vivid. Um, they're there, but uh, it's postmodernist and that they've taken and colored them. Uh, and they've also colored the exterior of this cube. Now it's squares, 
uh, but nevertheless, a modernist wouldn't have done that uh, checkerboarding on the exterior. And the windows are all odd shapes. If you ever get a chance, this is often open on doors open. If you ever get a chance, go to it and go up there. You get some beautiful views to the south from these windows. It's fascinating to walk around and to realize you're elevated above all this in this sort of tabletop of a building. So uh, any, many of the buildings you might be looking at may be a composite of, of these styles. Because as I said at the beginning, architecture is, uh, is a, a continuum. Uh, and architects often borrow from the past uh, to plug into what they want to build now. So finally, uh, one of the great things about 1940 plus architecture is that you can often find information about the architects and builders for these structures. Uh, building permits uh, started to be used in the 1950s, 60s. City of Toronto, they actually go back to the 1890s. But you know, if your municipality keeps building permits, they would be listed on, on the building permits. Uh, so my next point is municipalities have designated and listed uh, post-1940 structures. So you can do it. The designation criteria does not exclude modern architecture. All it has to do is meet one of the criteria, of course, the more criteria to meet, the better, but it doesn't have to be old. Just the importance of the architect or the fact that it is a landmark can justify uh, designation, recommending designation to your council. And lastly, uh, you should consider the landscape that is associated with these structures when you're listing or designation. In this case, the Hart Massey House the topography, the slope of the land, and the trees around it were very much a part of the design of the building. So it is important that that design be kept uh, as, as part of the retention of the building. Similarly, uh, Toronto City Hall. This square is a major event square, uh, and it it's connects the residents very much with, with City Hall. Um, it's also a tourist Mecca. When I worked in City Hall and came out at lunchtime, I had to make my way through all the tourists that were taking pictures of this building. I tried to avoid getting in, in any of the pictures, but there were busloads that would come by this building just to see it. So uh, those are my, that's my presentation. Uh, I hope it's been of value to you, and uh, I can take any comments or questions you might have. Hi, Wayne. Yes. Hi, uh, it's Pamela. I uh, just wanted to thank you very much for uh, the informative and fascinating presentation. I uh, really liked hearing your personal stories about the buildings, like the ROM and Toronto City Hall and Roy Thompson Hall. It really made their histories come alive and make the buildings more relatable. Uh, I just want to give you a, um, an update on the Hilt House. Uh, it is now indeed designated and good. is being restored right now. Good, yeah. good. Yeah, yeah. And actually, um, a heritage permit is coming forward next month because some structural issues have come forward. So the Heritage Committee is going to get to know this building very well in the coming months. It, it was a, a fascinating building to work in. As I say, I, when I did that study, I you know, I do the outside of the building and then I asked to get in and I wanted to see the interior and how the interior obviously had been readapted. But what was fascinating to me and I found I was spending far too much time in the basement going through these filing cabinets of pictures. There were <laughs> hundreds and hundreds of pictures uh, that had just been left behind. And, and uh, it was fortunate that I came across 
a few of those older photographs that help show how the how the building had been had evolved. But uh, that's great that it's now designated and and uh, the committee be, will be working with it. Mm -hmm. In fact, I donated the photographs that I found uh, to the Richmond Hill Library. So you'll see them in, in uh, uh, I forget the, the room where heritage research <laughs> takes place mm -hmm. in the library, but they're in that room. Oh, that's awesome. That's okay. wonderful, thank you. Hey Wang, um, this is Helen. Uh, thank you so much for such a informative uh, session. I uh, learned a lot and it's in our local uh, context. Um, a question for the OCAD building. Um, if you can go back to the uh, picture. Yes, so those columns, the pencils, right? Are they also um, the um, structural um, supporting columns? Oh yes, very much so. Yeah, the, the, the architects like to call those pilates, oh, pilates. Uh, okay. and and so they are are very much the structural element uh, of this building. Uh, so they're they're they are what is holding it up. Uh, mm -hmm. So you can imagine the engineering that had to go into the design of this building, but you can see the pilates here, but. It, it it's, comes through in a number of other modernist buildings. So here, in a much more modest scale, you have uh, Pilates mm -hmm. supporting this house. Uh, and so that's part of the international design element. And then the Toronto Dominion Centre, uh, Mies van der Rohe. So the actual... Uh, structural elements of the building are right here, mm -hmm. but you go in under the building uh, into the ground floor. Um, and uh, uh, so these are also referred to as Pilates okay. uh, because they are exterior, they appear to be exterior to the building. And in fact, Mies wanted to set those off but they're structural elements. They're the structure of the building coming down uh, to the ground, the foundation and the bedrock supporting this, this building. So yes, those the Pilates are, are very much structural elements. By the way, I should add that when I was working down at, at City Hall, a lot of these uh, tall buildings are, are, are uh, um, they have a glass, uh, uh, wall curtain walls uh, and uh, they're inhabited a lot of lawyers offices are in there and one lawyer uh, it, it, sad story but one lawyer said look at this this you know it's floor to ceiling window in this building and you can throw yourself against the glass wall and you'll be just fine well in fact the uh, the uh, elements that were holding the glass into the wall gave out and the whole glass fell out along with that lawyer. So he must have really made an impression on those uh, articling law students that he was showing off the office to. But yeah, uh, sorry, that's uh, <laughs> an odd aside. Thank you. Okay. Um I'd like to ask a question. It's just um, there are two pieces, two properties in Richmond Hill that I think could be designated under, you know, they're modern. One is the Richmond Hill Public Library, and the other is Larsh Daybreak. So I just was wondering, from uh, Joanne's and Pamela's perspective, you know, it, um, do you agree? Is it something that we could do? Is it sort of like a pilot project for that we could undertake to have? you know, to start this whole process for designating more modern recent buildings? Hi, so um, I think that they are both really interesting and worthy building, certainly for the library, the architecture significance uh, given, and also the social significance, um, large daybreak also. 
-hmm. I think the, the question is, I think to be listed is actually probably reasonable. To designate, it will probably take um, some work. Um, not that it's not worth, worthy. A lot of time, um, I'm notwithstanding the uh, municipal ownership. A lot of times when a, a building is being used very well and then being taken care of, there's a reluctance on the owner's part to designate a building simply because there might be fear of, uh, of, of processes that might delay them if they want to make changes to the building. Um, this is something that we also, you know, would, uh, uh, you know, also have, have seen that this is kind of a situation with churches, for instance, mm. you know, churches that are very well designed, but, but um, the, uh, you know, the, the people who are using it would not want to designate simply because they are afraid of, of having to make changes for functional reason and having to, you know, do a lot of additional work that might not even be approved. So um, I think that we should certainly can discuss this um, mm -hmm. at our, our committee and, and talk about it. Yeah, for sure. Okay. Yeah, I know Large Daybreak again, another international, I believe internationally, we know one, as you said, star, star architect, I like that word, um, that uh, for that building as well. So it's just, um, yes, I, I admire uh, that building. Yes, I, yes, um, it's, uh, it's designed by um, DTAH uh, and, and one of the architects, principal architect there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a very beautiful building. Um, uh, last day we did talk to us a little bit about uh, designating the property because they feel that they might be able mm -hmm. to take advantage of the grant yep. funding. Um, again, uh, further discussion make them sort of hesitate because yep. you know there might be changes to to the uses of the building that they might not be able to you know uh, anticipate at this point. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Okay. So, um, well, I think that uh, it's been such an excellent uh, uh, presentation. It's really, really informative and it's rich in material and, and very broad in terms of the overarching developer architecture style in Canada and Ontario. So I, I think that uh, we, really, we really appreciate and, and enjoy this, this, uh, this presentation. Um, on behalf of the city of Richard Hill, I would like to thank you, Wayne, and ah, what's the other lady, uh, Jeanette, yeah. for joining us today. Um, if there is, um, if there's no more additional question, then maybe we could um, sign off, yeah. and we can confirm that um, Jeanette. Uh, you could uh, send us a present. I think that the presentation is already uh, with us, is it? I think, did you send us a copy of the presentation yet? No, not uh, yet. No, I'm going to send the, uh, I'm going to send a link for the video uh, presentation mm -hmm. and a copy of the PowerPoint. Okay, that's to perfect. Pamela, and then she can distribute it to, uh, to everybody uh, and keep it on file for other newer members later or something like that. Yes, that's really, really great. And I just also want to, you know, uh, let you know that if there's any other presentation that CHO is, is, is available to us to let us know. Uh, I think that our committee will be very interested in, in actually learning more about um, other architectural style or activities that you guys may, may have uh, installed. Yeah, actually, um, our website, uh, community Ontario, uh, communityheritageontario.ca, if you look under education, there are a lot of videos there that, that we've done either recently or from conferences, uh, presentation, and we, they, they're all on YouTube, actually. We have a YouTube channel. So if you look at Community Heritage Ontario uh, in YouTube, you'll be able to find uh, our videos and the website's the same and the website also has other information. Uh, but I think we have about 12 videos now that are, that are uh, in, the, in the system. Okay, that's really great to know. Well, is there anyone else who would like to say a few words? I did want to ask a question. I'm not sure. I mean, we're already 50 minutes over. Is it okay? Do we have some time? Sure. I'm, I'm, I'm fine. <laughs> well, thank you, uh, Wayne. This was a really uh, good presentation. I very much enjoyed it. I, I have a couple questions, but maybe I'll start with the uh, 
victory housing example that you presented, um, the example in Kitchener. I was wondering if you also have encountered other examples um, with this particular style that have been preserved. They seem to be um, the first ones on the chopping block or, or, or more difficult to kind of um, to, to designate uh, perhaps because of, you know, um, just, just, the, just the small sort of um, proportions or, or maybe um, modest uh, style that they have. And I wanted to know what your experience is with this type of, of, of dwelling elsewhere in Ontario. Um, the, well, I, I haven't had much experience in, in getting these designated. Um, Kitchener was uh, a very odd situation. They did bring in a, a consultant there in 2001 and um, actually went out, reached out to the community uh, to pursue uh, designation of this district. And, and as I said, the residents embraced this. Um, there are challenges with uh, dealing with designation because these are small houses and uh, given the market today, uh, people often want to build additions. So the guidelines for this district, they're, they're on uh, the city of Kitchener website, uh, do show how uh, the buildings can be added onto without uh, adversely affecting the character of the district as a whole. Uh, the, the emphasis being primarily uh, alterations to the rear rears of the buildings. So this this is the only area where I'm aware of they have been successful, uh, but it's not an issue that I've explored in detail. Uh, so there there may and, be and others. you mentioned these types of housing are more I guess. Um, uh, successful in becoming designated if they are grouped is that that I understand that correctly yeah they um, the the areas uh, well in this case it was successful it was a group of housings these were often done as as uh, almost like subdivision developments uh, the federal government the wartime housing uh, authority would come in and, and develop this wartime housing eventually became CMHC. But they, they came in and designed these subdivisions in, in total. But they made the plans available to anybody who wanted them. So there was no charge for them. So you find a lot of people in, in the 50s and even early 60s taking these plans and building standalone housing units uh, of their own because they were modest, they were affordable, and the plans existed and there was no charge. So uh, I've, I've, I've seen examples of that and I've uh, pointed out when I've done heritage impact assessments, these are uh, of the style of wartime housing but you should uh, look into it in more detail to make sure they are associated with the, the wartime housing effort and not just uh, you know somebody who's come along later and decided to, to build a standalone house. I see. We, we do have, well, I can recall subdivisions in Toronto that were well after the war, they were into the 19, well into the 1950s and they used the same style of housing uh, because it was so affordable and easy to put up. And many of these were actually prefabricated um, when they were put up by the Wartime Housing Authority. Um, so, uh, you know, I, I have, as I said, I haven't had a, much experience with, the, with dealing with this type of housing, getting it listed or designated. But I can say if you're looking at a group of these type of houses uh, that were done during the war or shortly after the war, uh, it, it's, I think, much more justifiable to get them listed or designated than, than uh, if they were built much later on. Um, thank you. Um, my other question is primarily perhaps related to the, um, the Heritage Act and the politics of heritage. And I'm 
um, eager to uh, hear from you, um, your experience with um, heritage committees um, in Ontario being advisory to council. And depending on um, the, the political you know, um, mood of, of the day or of that council, um, heritage can be um, you know, either preserved um, well or not. And, and how has your experience been with that particular aspect of positioning the heritage committee as an advisory um, as it's defined in the Planning Act, obviously. Um, have there been times in, in Ontario where this particular aspect has been brought forward as, a, as an issue or a problem, or is this historically how uh, things have been in, in, in your experience? Um, well, th there's, I guess, a wide range of experience for heritage committees. Um, as, as long as the heritage committee recognizes that it, it is advisory, uh, it ad advises council and council has the, uh, the final say on, on whether or not to list or designate because it is council's, uh, uh, under the legislation, the Ontario Heritage Act, it is council's right to do that. Um, now, sometimes uh, the heritage committee has gotten mad at council for not uh, following their advice. Uh, there was a committee in, in uh, Muskoka that completely disbanded when, when the uh, council wouldn't follow their advice. Um, I had 20 years experience in Newmarket as chair of a heritage committee. And there were times when the council would not fo would follow our advice, which we, you said, you know, that's a, that's a victory. Uh, and there were times when it would not follow our advice. And my attitude was, uh, if I'm not here to help identify these properties and put them forward to council, nobody's going to do it. So even if I lose, I still am uh, there to advise council. And I recognize that my role is strictly advisory uh you know that that even happened when i was an employee uh so i was a heritage employee at the city of toronto we would make our advice to to council now granted there, there are years of experience behind our advice but there were times when council ignored its own planners and said no we aren't going to follow your advice we've got a different opinion on this and sometimes council regretted doing that. And there are other times they were very happy that they had made their own decision independent of what their own staff had said. Yeah. So it's, you're, you're, all I can say is your, your role is advisory. Keep that in mind. Uh, council's not always going to follow what you have to say. They may have different agendas. They, they may be considering many more uh, factors in, in a development, uh, but you, you put forward as best you can uh, arguments that support listing or designation. Thank you, Wayne. And thank you, Jeanette. Okay, if, if there's nothing further, uh, uh, I, I'd like to thank you very much and uh, we'll get that information out to you then and I'll say good night to everybody. Thank you very much.